Welcome to the first Alan Finney Three Minutes Final. So this is an exciting event in the department. You may wonder who I am. You may, some of you may not have seen me a lot uh, around the corridor of LMP. I'm, uh, I'm Laurent Bozek. I'm going to be your host for today. I'm the husband of Johnny Bozek, as some of you may know. Uh, I'm a professor in the uh, Faculty of Dentistry. I, I'm French, you can hear with a French accent, so I've got an advantage when I just myself, because I can see the French accent is advantage. And I'm, of course, appointed in LMP. And I've been running student thesis for about 10 years, and that's the third department faculty where we start from scratch a student thesis competition. So I'm very excited, and it's just uh, the opening of a new era for the department. So, three minute thesis is a competition that run internationally. In Canada, we've got HEAT at the University of Toronto in faculty, in department, final in department. School of Graduate Studies run its own competition. And then eventually there is a provincial competition, and then there is even a national competition. So this is a great opportunity for students to go and, and showcase their research and their skills nationally. I'm not aware of an international competition, but you never know. Student thesis is a very complicated, very difficult task to, to do well. You have to present your research in three minutes with a, and making sure that the research you present is understandable, not by your peer scientists, by the general public. We tend to tell students it has to be about a grade 8 level entry for everyone to understand it. So think about this when you're going to hear some speakers today and how well they try to craft the message such as all of you can understand it. So, before today, we had heat in the department and we had a number of judges that spent time to review the video entry that the candidates submitted and based on the set of criteria, and we use the same set of criteria that the SGS gave us, and we want particularly to thank all the judges. You can see that Dominic, Greg, Anna, Mirat, Naomi, Nelson, Rosemary, Stephen, and Zoriana. So maybe we can give them a round of applause for the <laughs> But today, as it goes into all swimming thesis, uh, heat and final, we don't want the judges to be, I guess, to, to have seen the previous submission of the candidate. So we remove all the heat judges and we appoint a new panel of judges. And today, we have Darinda with us, we have Linda with us, and we have Myron with us. So thank you for joining us today. And um, the pièce de résistance of the show is not the judges, it is a candidate who have put themselves forward to come and do this competition. So we've got Juliet, Ian, Caroline, Ingrid, Shurian, and Suji. So well done for you for enabling this event to take place today. And in just a few seconds, we're going to be starting. So maybe a big round of applause, encouragement to our candidates. All oh, right. Has anybody got any questions about swimming thesis? Do you all understand what it is? Churches, are you ready? <laughs> Candidates, are you ready? <laughs> Juliet, the floor is yours. So Juliet is going to talk about cracking open the difference between the egg-grown and cell-grown influenza vaccine. Stop. Juliet, you got three minutes. When you go to get your influenza vaccine, you're likely in a pharmacy or vaccine clinic in line next to other people also waiting for their shots. And you probably assume that what's in your vaccine is identical to what's being injected into the arm of the person in front of you and the person behind you. But that might not be the case. Influenza vaccines, or flu shots, contain a protein found on the outside of the influenza virus, as shown in the figure, which our immune system then learns to recognize 
and defend us against. We get a new flu shot every year because influenza viruses evolve very quickly. This is because these viruses make a lot of errors as they replicate, leading to later generations of virus that don't always look exactly like their predecessors. When these changes occur on these specific surface proteins, they can affect what our immune system learns to recognize. While these changes may seem scary, they aren't necessarily a bad thing. A model previously developed by our group showed that vaccine diversity may lead to better population immunity by not giving the viruses a lot of room to evolve as they circulate each flu season. The goal of my project is to test how these viruses evolve in two different influenza growth systems. Fertile chicken eggs, which is the traditional and most commonly used system, and mammalian cell culture, which is a newer method. To best replicate what actually happens in vaccine production, I obtained influenza viruses that were used in real influenza vaccines from recent years. After growing these viruses in both methods and sequencing them to obtain their genetic codes, I found that influenza viruses grown in fertile chicken eggs show much more diversity in this target surface protein than their cell-grown counterparts, meaning it's possible that egg-based vaccines are more diverse than cell-based vaccines. I hope that the results from my project will help inform decisions made by vaccine manufacturers as they get cracking on future influenza vaccines to ensure that the flu shot that's administered to you and those in line with you at the pharmacy is keeping all of you protected as effectively as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. For the judges, it was two minutes and 39 seconds. So next in line is Amy, who's going to talk about shape sorting cue for protein to better understand disease. OK. Johnny Cash, a famous American singer-songwriter in the 1990s, is known for his sorrow theme songs, especially songs from the later stages of his career. He was diagnosed with multiple system atrophy a rare and aggressive movement disorder, where he passed away just six years after his diagnosis. Did you know that our brain is made up of many proteins? Either due to genetic or environmental factors, these proteins can change in shape, disrupting normal functions in the brain. Of these, protein A is linked to multiple system atrophy. Once the protein A's take on a different shape than the normal protein A's, it becomes malicious piling up inside the brain cells. And when these cells accumulate so much of these bad protein A's, the cells can become sad, causing movement dysfunction like Johnny had. Johnny was first misdiagnosed with Parkinson's disease. This is because multiple system atrophy patients can have similar symptoms that may be mistaken as other movement disorders. So the only way to make a final diagnosis is through an examination of the brain at autopsy where the neuropathologist confirms the presence of these bad protein A's in the brain. But recognizing the disease may just be the tip of an iceberg. Although there are two subtypes of the disease, it remains difficult to distinguish between the two because of the varying disease duration and symptoms. Therefore, I measured the size of these bad protein A's that have accumulated inside the brain cells of multiple system atrophy patients. Using artificial intelligence as a shape sorting cube, I have sorted the different sizes of these bad protein A's into different groups. Then, I will identify the distinguishing feature of each subtype. For example, if some patients have larger size and a rounder shape of the bad protein A's in the brain, they would be classified as subtype 3. And those in subtype 3 may particularly have a longer disease duration than others who are in a different subtype. So why does this matter? The different size and shapes of these bad protein A's in the brain and the distinguishing factors associated with each subtype can give us insight into how multiple system atrophy can be further subclassified. And this novel and unbiased approach using artificial intelligence can deepen our understanding of the disease. 
adding value to the current efforts in developing tailored treatments so that people like Johnny can be treated before severe symptoms take over. Thank you. Okay, judges, it was two minutes 40 seconds. So what the judges are scoring, um, does anybody really know where the three minutes is this concept come from? Now let me tell you a story. A little while back there was a, a drought in Australia. And the team of um, one of the schools in, uh, in Queensland was having a shower. The whole thing. And during the drought, the shower they made, well, they made it at three minutes. And you know what I have to do in the shower? So I have to think about what, what was the homework that I give to the students. And that, that was the birth of the screaming thesis because of the length of time the shower needed to be taken during the during the drought in, in Australia. So this became the base of, uh, of the, the basis for the thesis. And to this day, the University of Queensland is very attached to the screaming concept. And in fact, anybody who wants to run a screaming thesis in any faculty, department, university, needs to ask for permission of the University of Queensland to run it. I do have permission to run it. <laughs> So the next one is Calvin. 10 kilometers doesn't sound like a crazy distance. You could drive 10 kilometers in 10 minutes. You might be able to run it in one hour. But in Hamilton, Ontario, 10 kilometers is the difference between living and dying. Hamilton's Keith neighborhood has the lowest average income and the least access to family doctors in the whole city. While Keith neighborhood residents live on average until only age 65, people who live in another Hamilton neighborhood less than 10 kilometers away live on average until age 86. That's more than a 20 year difference in life expectancy. Thus far, very little has been done to address the pressing health needs of this community. But this spring, a group of family doctors in Hamilton is opening a new health clinic in the Keith neighborhood. Despite having raised funds for the clinic's construction and operations, one critical question remained unanswered. How does one actually design a health clinic that meets community needs now and as time goes on? That's where my research comes in. I'm working with two other graduate students, and the focus of our research is developing a model of care for the clinic that is responsive, meaning it can adapt to the community's changing needs, and context appropriate, meaning it provides care that the community actually wants and needs. My research has three main steps. First, my team and I are going to interview Keith neighborhood community members and ask them, what are your health needs? This is the stage of research that we're currently at. Second, we're gonna interview um, healthcare and social service workers who work in the Keith neighborhood and ask them, what is required to provide excellent healthcare services? The third and final step of my research is actually doing something with all the information that we collect from our interviews. The insights of the people that we speak to will become a suggested model of care for the clinic, meaning a list of key priorities related to which health services the clinic should offer and how they should coordinate the delivery of these health services. Talking to people who actually live and work in the Keith neighborhood will ensure that the clinic is designed um, for them and by them. In the short term, this will translate to a high-functioning primary care clinic that is well-positioned to serve its patients. In the long term, my research fits within a greater context of improving the community's access to primary care, which will improve health outcomes. Almost 800,000 people live in Hamilton, but the health of all these individuals is far from equal. My research will amplify the voices of people who need it the most in order to improve healthcare access. When one neighborhood becomes healthier, stronger, it strengthens all of us as a collective. Wouldn't it be great if in 10 years from now, 10 kilometers didn't mean so much? Thank you. So this was two minutes and 55 seconds. So what is the church in that scoring? So I've been training students for over 10 years about screen thesis and Sometimes students can see and say, you know, Dr. Bozak, I've not done any research yet. Why, I, why should I do this through the thesis? So the whole point about 3MT is not about what you have done, 
is what you're going to do and to have a plan to execute. And you don't need to have done a single experiment in the lab to be able to give a good student thesis. It's just about talking about the PI, the supervisor, and to know about the background of your research and try to put the story together. So, student thesis, it's all about the story, about the research. And just like a children's story, while your audience is a bit like the children, you need to make sure they understand what you're talking about. And that's what the art of the student thesis is. Next one, Ingrid. Time is precious. It can all start with a persistent headache that you find out much too late is a brain tumor. If only we could detect brain cancer earlier and monitor disease progression. With my research, I add an at-home solution to this challenge. Especially for patients with brain tumors, infrequent hospital visits may not be enough to detect a growing tumor earlier, which is critical for improved outcomes where other treatments have failed. Remote monitoring makes it possible to frequently collect reliable health data by yourself at home. It could be as simple as wearing a biotracking device that's meant for meditation and picking up a tablet device from home. If smartwatches can detect heart rate abnormalities, then with my research, I can detect brain abnormalities at home. First, I recruit healthy participants to record data at home using a laptop and brain wearable. I analyze recordings characterizing individual specific biosignatures. The signature is like a fingerprint, and I can monitor changes in electrical activity through time. In healthy participants, I observed symmetrical activity between both sides of the brain, consistent through all recordings. Then I applied this remote approach to patients with brain tumors who recorded data at home, which has never been done, building a unique data set through time and disease progression. <laughs> Characterizing patient-specific biosignatures can inform the state of patients' brain health. In brain tumor patients, I observed asymmetrical brain activity between the tumor lesion side and the healthy side of the brain. Specifically, decreased activity around the tumor location. Altogether, through time, I can detect brain abnormalities from tumors as confirmed from patients' hospital standard medical imaging. And applying a artificial intelligence, I can predict and distinguish between the tumor growth. This approach could alert users on their phones to seek medical attention sooner. This has practical clinical significance, saving patients and hospitals from numerous strenuous and expensive medical imaging. Brain tumor patients indicate a strong willingness to record data every day at home, especially if it will help reduce anxiety. This is why we need a feasible at-home approach to non-invasively monitor brain health for cancer and other neurological diseases like dementia and depression. And soon these brain wearable technology will be more accessible in earbuds and hats so the health monitoring approach can be at your fingertips from home maintaining quality of life. Time is life, life is precious, my research will save lives. Thank you. So this was two minutes and 45 seconds. So a lot of work goes into preparing a student thesis, from preparing a pitch to preparing a slide. These slides do not come just like that. There are many different iterations. Feedback to students. Some students decide not to have feedback and decide to do it on their own, and that's okay. So the pitch takes time to, to elaborate, to, to, so we try to teach the students how to follow a certain pattern in the script. But again, the students have liberty to do what they, what they wish to do. So well done for the student who try to take part in this condition. Well, I'm finished, don't worry. I'm just trying to fill the blank for the judges, I think. <laughs> judges, are we ready? Okay. The next penultimate is Shunyan. Please close your eyes for a moment and imagine yourself feeling of drowning. This is the defined experience of someone with long-term lung disease. As we speak, another individual succumbs to this harsh reality. The cure lies in lung transplantation, but the shortage of donor lungs as too many face a tragic tale while waiting. As an alternative donor lung, human engineer lungs offer hope, but challenges persist in making them fully functional. This is where my research has been, exploring the impact of ventilation which is a simple act of breathing outside our body 
on these bioengineered lungs. Think of the lung as a delicate structure with tiny air sacs called alveoli, which much like a balloon. My goal is to make those balloons stronger and more resilient, akin to exercise, making our muscles stronger, similar to making our lungs stronger, would be impactful to our health. In my study, I use a mouse lung model as a framework. By making the lungs breathe outside our body, I was able to make the lung structure remain undamaged. The lungs maintain their strength and flexibility, just like a well-stretched balloon. Next. Let's, next, let's talk about the heart of the matter. Our lung is like a complex orchestra with various cells playing their part. I introduced the human lung cells into the framework and let them experience the gentle breathing process. The results were exciting. The cells were happier and showed fewer signs of damage compared to the lungs that's not been breathed. Now, imagine the potential of this study. A future where individuals with long-term disease can breathe freely again. Not just because of available donor lungs, but because the lungs have been stretched and well exercised. My next step is planting seeds. I want to see whether humans' most versatile cells, the stem cells, can withstand the ventilation and live happily in our body. In essence, my study is about making engineered lungs more robust, like a well exercised machine. Our lungs are like balloons, delicate and vulnerable. Now envision them not just as a balloon, but balloons that's being exercised, well stretched, and prepared to face the challenge of life. This study is about giving hope, strength, and a breath of life for those who need it the most. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it was two minutes, 28 seconds. So you can see that two minutes is a long time. It's a long time when you're standing on the podium there. I'm trying to get to the very close as close as we can to three minutes. I can tell you, it's not easy. Stress comes into play. Something called adrenaline kicks in, and you tend to speak fast. And I can tell you, having listened to many previous diseases, our candidates have done a lot of work to try to calm themselves down and try to make sure that the pace of delivery is adequate. But yet you can see, we are sometimes running a little bit away from three minutes, and that's part of the exercise. Next, uh, next, and uh, I think the last minute is Suji. 39 million people around the world are currently infected with HIV, but most of us just know that it's a viral infection that invades your immune system. But what does that really mean? Think of your immune system as a battlefield. We have different types of immune cells that act as soldiers. You have your helper T cells that act as foot soldiers, and then you have your killer T cells that act as snipers. And HIV is the invader. And it's not just a typical invader that your immune soldiers can recognize easily. Instead, as seen on the left, um, HIV approaches your foot soldiers, sneaks into them, and then corrupts them. And though there are treatments that can prevent and reduce this corruption by HIV, there's currently no cure. But I hypothesize that the secret to a cure are the very soldiers that your immune soldiers, um, that HIV, the immune soldiers that HIV invades. Some, this is because some people with HIV are able to control their infection without any treatment. These people have really smart snipers that can control their HIV accurately because they recognize small, smart features that the foot soldiers who have been taken over by HIV present, as you can see on the middle of the slide. So, a current goal of HIV cure therapy is to figure out which of these markings we should train our snipers to recognize so they can attack our corrupted soldiers more efficiently. My research investigates someone who can control their HIV without any treatment, and I'm trying to figure out which of these markings on their foot soldiers who have been taken over by HIV allow their snipers to recognize them most efficiently. To do this, I will first test the response of this person's snipers to different markings of the soldiers who have been infected by HIV, and I will see which of these markings are allowing the snipers to recognize them most easily, which of them allow the snipers to attack them most accurately and with the most um,
lethal types of bullets, as seen on the right of the slide. Then, I will test the ability of snipers who are given the training they need to recognize these markings to then actually go ahead and attack the corrupted soldiers more efficiently. My research to figure out what training the immune soldiers of our immune system need to better detect and target HIV will provide the foundation for the development of a treatment against HIV so patients no longer have to take lifelong treatments that can cause severe side effects and financial burden. Indeed, I know that this will provide a steps towards developing a vaccine against HIV, something that researchers have been working on for over 40 years. Thank you. So this, this was three minutes, zero, zero. <laughs> So one of the judges are finishing this course, maybe we can get all the candidates to come up on stage and you give them a massive round of applause. I want to pass the mic to Atifa, one of the judges that are working this course, because Atifa is a three-minute thesis specialist, having gone all the way, all the way, and she may want to manage a question also. Is this a question for the audience? Sure. Thank you so much. This is Brandon, but here we are. <laughs> I can totally appreciate just how hard you all have worked to be where you are right now, so congrats to all of you. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, so congrats, truly. I'd love for you all to tell the audience maybe what, what was the most difficult part of preparing for today. Um, and maybe I'll just pick a couple people to, to give a response to that. Um, Shulan, do you yeah, want to? Sure. Yeah, um, so I think that... You just want to use the mic, maybe on the podium? So I think the most difficult part is like preparing the script and um, actually do the recording and actually when you uh, I, I try to practice um, uh, like some in, in home but um, just sometimes you will always forget uh, the clues that when you're talking and sometimes you just need some hint to help you to move forward and actually when you're standing on the stage it's very different from where you practice in home because you're facing a lot of people and your pace will change and I think uh, 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 to take that into account is very important when prepared. Totally, I think like Dr. Berzak was saying, three minutes is simultaneously nothing and the longest time ever. <laughs> so, um, maybe I'll ask one other person um, how you helped yourself prepare for today and maybe I'll ask you again. Yeah, so um, I was very fortunate to get a feedback session with Dr. Bozek, which was very informative as somebody who's never done a three-minute thesis before. Um, and just a lot and a lot of practice of standing in the clothes that you're going to wear when you're presenting to really get a feel for it and just saying it over and over again in the mirror. Um, and obviously you can never really truly mimic the experience of being up here in front of an audience, but trying to control the things that you can repeat over and over again um, was, I found, very helpful. Totally. Um, I have a is almost ready. We can hear a little bit. But I'm very excited because I will be hosting the UT3 MTS series. So hopefully some of you will 